Hey, eighth grade. What do you do when you wake up with a fever and you realize that you're late for your online classes? You say, self isolate. <laughs> oh man, that one's good. Um, did you hear the joke about the germ? Actually, never mind. I don't want to spread it around. Oh man. Uh, I ran out of toilet paper and so I start started having to use old newspapers. Times are rough. I could go all day with these jokes, but unfortunately we have material to get to. We have to talk about discrimination against African Americans in the South and how that relates to discrimination against immigrants. Uh, in the North. And then we're also going to talk, if we have time, about discrimination against African Americans in the North and something called the Cotton Kingdom. All right, so we're on slide 13. Um, in the previous slide, I talked about uh, immigration from Ireland and Germany and how immigrants from those two countries were treated differently in the United States. Remember, the Germans were generally treated better than the Irish because the Irish were universally poor and Catholic, whereas the Germans were Protestant and some of them were quite wealthy. So the difference between um, those two groups matters because of their religion and also because of their wealth. Right? Wealthy immigrants are going to be treated better than immigrants who are not. Um, the idea is because wealthy immigrants are going to have more to contribute to society, they're going to be more likely to invest in businesses or to purchase territory or homes to pay their taxes, et cetera, et cetera. They're also more likely to be educated. Um, and then the difference in treatment based on the religious belief stems from the identification of most Americans at this time with Protestantism, which is very anti-Catholic uh, in the 1800s. All right. Um, so even though the German immigrants were generally treated better than the Irish immigrants, that doesn't mean that people were happy that we were getting a lot of immigrants from Germany. In fact, a lot of Americans were very worried that there were too many immigrants coming into, into the United States. Um, and some of these people who are worried about this opposed immigration in general because they were they belong to a group of people that we call nativists. So a nativist is a person, an American citizen who wants America to remain white, Protestant, and native born. Right? So think about those two groups of immigrants I've talked about, the Germans and the Irish. The Germans check two of the boxes, but the Germans are not native born. Right? So nativists did not like German immigration, but they really, really didn't like Irish immigration because the only thing the Irish had in common with what they thought an American should be is the Irish were white. Uh, so nativism starts to grow in the United States and it forms into a political movement that takes form in a political party called the Know Nothing Party. Um, and the reason it's called the Know Nothing Party is because um, they were kind of secretive at first. Uh, the idea was if you belong to the Know Nothing Party and someone asked you about it, you were supposed to say, I know nothing. So they call themselves the Know Nothing Party. Um, the Know Nothing Party actually became quite powerful in the United States. It um, pushed a candidate who ran for president, in fact, um, in the 1856 election. And this candidate won 21 percent of the vote. So a lot of people voted for the Know Nothing candidate. It shows you nativism was not like some fringe radical belief system in the United States. It was actually quite popular. All right, so Irish and German immigrants, immigrants from Europe in general, faced a lot of discrimination. 
Uh, but the people who were treated worse in the, the, the worst out of everyone in the United States were people who were not white. So these would be Native Americans and, of course, African Americans. Now, students like to ask, you know, what about immigrants from like Mexico or other parts of Latin America? Uh, your book doesn't talk about them very much at this point because during the Industrial Revolution, uh, there simply were not very many uh, Latin American, Mexican, or Asian immigrants in the United States. Those immigration waves come a lot later, right? So uh, if you were not a white native-born American, um, then if you were not white, then really you'd only belong to one of two other groups. You'd be Native Americans or you'd be uh, African American. All right, so African Americans were treated the worst out of all of these groups that nativists and even general Americans didn't like. Um, now, the treatment of African Americans differed very sig significantly in the United States based on geography. So in the North, slavery was outlawed in the early 1800s, the abolitionist movement had taken root. There were a lot of Americans in the North who believed that the phrase all men are created equal extended to include black men as well, not just whites. Um, but even though slavery in the North was over in the early 1800s, freed African Americans in the North and in the South, because there were some who were free in the South as well, were still not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to work in factories. They were not allowed to work in skilled trades. So there were laws that were passed that were outlawing these things. Additionally, racial segregation and racial discrimination was very common. Um, so employers didn't want to hire black people, right? An employer would rather hire an Irish person, an Irish immigrant, than a black immigrant in most cases. Um, racial se segregation, of course, is a big problem. So a lot of African Americans um, don't get to go to worship services at the churches of their choosing because they don't allow black people inside of the churches. So what happens? Well, a lot of African Americans form their own churches. Likewise, they form their own businesses, schools, and newspapers. All right. So that's the end of section two. Now we're transitioning into section three, which is called the Plantation South. Uh, and hopefully we're gonna get to talk about the Cotton Kingdom. So um, the Industrial Revolution has a lot of consequences. And one of the main consequences in the United States was a significant increase in textile production. So a lot of the factories that are being built are textile mills. Right? So these are mills that produce uh, fabric using primarily cotton, right? So textiles start to be produced in massive amounts. Prices go down because the supply goes up. Remember in basic economics, an increase in supply usually means there's a decrease in the price. Right? So the more rare something is, the more expensive it is, the more common it is, the less expensive it is. Think of it that way. <coughs> um, so there's a lot more textiles than there used to be. Prices go down. When prices go down, what happens? People are more likely to buy your product if the price is lowered. So we have a lot of people who are buying these textiles. And again, textiles are basically any product made out of cloth or fabric. So blankets, uh, sheets, clothing, um, materials you would use to sew anything if you want to do that. Um, business, and these aren't just for personal consumption. Businesses are using textiles as well. So people want more and more of these textiles, the prices go lower and lower. So that means these factories are super busy. And in order to keep up with production demands, um, they need cotton. 
right? So the demand for cotton increases, but producing cotton is extremely difficult. So cotton grows naturally uh, and on plantations, on cotton plants, and harvesting cotton is a matter of going out into the fields and picking the cotton off of the plant. But the problem is the cotton that you harvest has these seeds inside of it, right? And you have to pull the seeds out of the cotton one by one. And this is really, really hard to do by hand, right? So at first, the cotton supply is not able to meet the demand. But this all changes when Eli Whitney... Um, it's the same Eli Whitney who invented the system of interchangeable parts, invents a very simple machine called the cotton gin. And the cotton gin is a very basic mechanical device that separates the cotton from the seeds. So this allows um, cotton production to expand exponentially uh, and allows workers to produce basically 50 times more cotton per day than before. So each individual worker, slave or paid employee, will be able to produce 50 times more cotton in a single day than they were before if they use a cotton gin. So now the cotton supply meets the cotton demand. Um, I don't remember, I had a joke about this. I don't remember what it was. Bummer. Well, it's kind of a, a clever little thing right there. All right. So because the cotton industry starts to explode in the South, the demand for slave labor is also going to explode in the South. Because if you're producing 50 times more cotton a day than you normally do, even if you're using a cotton gin, uh, you're going to need slaves to operate your cotton plantation. So slaves become a lot more numerous. They become uh, more expensive. So slavery is an example of an exception to the rule that supply uh, reduces price. In the South, actually, because slaves were so valuable, the fact that the supply went up didn't change the price. In fact, even though the supply went up, the price went up too. So slaves are actually a lot more expensive than they used to be. Um, Cotton becomes the greatest source of wealth in the United States. And there's a large area of the American South, primarily Alabama and Mississippi, although it's parts of, of Georgia as well, uh, and Arkansas. Um, and this area of the South becomes known as the Cotton Kingdom. Right? It's called a Cotton Kingdom because its economies were dominated by vastly a vastly wealthy upper class of individuals who had cotton plantations. The most powerful people in these places, even more powerful than the state governor, for example, are plantation owners. Right? Um, now, not everyone in the Cotton Kingdom is working on a cotton plantation. The majority of Southerners are still white, poor farmers who are like raising livestock and growing what they can on their little plot of land. But the economy is so dominated by cotton and these plantation owners that it starts to be called the cotton kingdom. All right. Um, so even though the cotton industry is booming, uh, underneath all of this, there's a growing concern uh, among Southerners, that the North, that the federal government is going to start to pressure us for the end of slavery. They're probably going to do this by passing restrictions on what you can and can't do with slaves. And, you know, they're afraid that basically slavery is going to be outlawed and their economy is going to collapse. Now, this pressure comes mainly from the North because this is where. Um, most of the abolitionists are. Right. Oh, and by the way, here on slide 15, I included a handy little image of a cotton plant. All right, we're going to stop here, um, and then I'll make another video where I go over some arguments that were used to defend slavery and arguments that were used against it.